Um, yes, so I am Ben Ward. I'm um, founder of Love Hurts. Uh, obviously, the Hurts means wireless for those of you who are um, I think it's probably, uh, white space spectrum is probably something very important. I think you may not have heard of. Um, who's heard of it? There's a little bit of quick stuff. White space spectrum, that's, that's actually quite a lot. Um, it's, it's developing. It's in a stage where it's still under trial from Ofcom. Uh, there's a pilot coming up. Um, what I'm going to show you is a bit about the background and how it works. And uh, I think thanks to Adrian, um, who knows what the internet is? That's getting, getting there. That's good. <coughs> okay. So I'll start off with um, how to use it, or what way you might use it first, uh, and then I'll explain a little bit about what it is. Um, so if you're here in the back end of nowhere, uh, you've got no copper, uh, this is extremely rural broadband, you'd be thankful for anything. So there's been a lot of confusion over, do you want 25 megabits per second, universal service commitment, all this kind of stuff. Some people just want to get on the internet. Um, that's what happens if a tsunami hits your telecom infrastructure. So let's say a uh, mobile base station after a tsunami has been through. Um, you need something set up quickly uh, uh, and simply to actually rebuild your communications infrastructure, possibly even to start the rescue. And finally, this is my representation of the internet of things. This is the smart city, uh, if you like. It's a city. Uh, if you can imagine, Every one of these blocks with how many sensors in doing all the internet things, things, um, measuring the temperature, doing central heating, doing uh, telling you whether someone's opened the door or not, whether your baby's awake or, or not. You've got to cover an awful lot of sensors there. Um, now, if only there was a technology that could do that, uh, that could cover an area like that, that would be quite useful. Otherwise, you've got to rely on everybody's broadband connection being all working at once. So it might be better to go in through the walls and actually connect directly to the devices. A bit like a mobile phone network. So, here's the background. This is Spectrum. Well, it's a representation of Spectrum. Uh, it's the American Spectrum represented, representing the UK Spectrum, but I didn't have to tell you that. So you don't need really to know that. Um, just to give you a point of where things are, uh, these two tiny slices here, they're where Wi-Fi lives. Uh, it's quite surprising, considering how much value you get out of Wi-Fi. That's all there is in that bed. And the ISM band is, there's a pair of them there, one at 868 and one at 433. That'd be how your current cost meter works, or your Zigbee, or any of these short-range protocols. So there's not a lot of spectrum out there. And this is license exempt, by the way. So you don't need permission or a license to operate equipment in these bands, which is why you can turn up and switch on your Wi-Fi and no one, you don't have to ask permission. There's one just there. They're all over the place here. It's that simple. You just turn up and switch it on. Um, that big yellow one there, that's where TV lives. And that's broadcast television, uh, sometimes called UHF band 4 or 5. Uh, looks quite useful, doesn't it? And it's not all used at once. It actually looks a bit like this. So this would be uh, before and after the digital switchover. Uh, there's a bunch of messy analog channels all bleeding all over the place. <coughs> over here, there's some nice, simple, defined digital channels. You see the gaps in between are actually white spaces. And you, there's some pretty valuable spectrum in there you can use for um, wireless communication. And there's an awfully big gap at the end there when they cleared it. <coughs> although they might be trying to take that away. So um, I'll come to that in a bit. So you can do something, a bunch of things with Spectrum. You can either auction it, which is, tends to be the way things have been going so far. So if you look at the end, end of this one, 800 megahertz was auctioned off at the beginning of this year. You need two and a half billion pounds to buy a section of it. So uh, that's the difference between license exempt and license. That's, that's quite a big difference. Um, the alternative is you can share it. 
So if you think of uh, forest bikes, you don't own the bike, you just use the bike for the period where you need it, and then you give it back. It's a shared resource, and it's actually a lot more efficient way of using it. So who's heard of Vint Cerf? Who's, oh, okay. uh, who's heard of the internet? <laughs> okay. So Vint is one of the several, probably three hippies who created the internet for DARPA. Uh, back in the 60s, possibly, sometime around then. Um, he's a bit of a dude. Uh, he's still going. He now works for Google. Uh, don't hold that against him. Uh, how did that happen? How did Google become the... I don't know. I don't know when that happened. Um, now his, his view is don't do another spectrum auction. Um, do, think of sharing it instead. So make it open. Make it... Uh, license exempt. It's not about the money you get straight into the bank account when you actually sell the spectrum. It's about what people do with it and what the economy benefits from having a shared resource that we can all access. Uh, whereas if you, if you look at the receipts from Vodafone or O2 or EE, that adds up to um, 10 billion, I think, something around 10 billion pounds. No, it was 3 billion, wasn't it? It wasn't as much as 3G anyway. Uh, so you're, you're looking at, um, at the value of the spectrum rather than the receipts from the auction. Now, what has this got to do with us? What can we do about it? Um, since my Occupy Spectrum, if we, if we start using it, it'll be hard to justify taking it away and selling it. Uh, and that's really what I hoped being an open source hardware camp, there would be people who felt the same way about this. Um, what can you use it for? You can use it for guerrilla sense networks. Um, for instance, here I've decided to climb under bridges. I haven't done this, by the way. But climbing under bridges in Oxford, putting water level sensors in uh, to tell whether my house is going to flood. Uh, because the environment agency has about three sensors, and that's it. You can't really tell. So if you put your own in, how are you going to connect them back to something? Well, that's the uh, first application of TV light space. Um, community broadband, I mean, it's got a good footprint. It's about something like eight kilometers. Environment is uh, around 16 megs down to, well, down to a triple if you like, but it's not a huge amount of battery. So it's, it's got a community size to it. It's, not, it's never going to set the world light as an ISP technology unless you're back in one of those houses at the end of nowhere. Um, you can set it up very quickly. It's very simple to use. Uh, and it's not like setting up a mobile base station. So it'll actually be good for events. You know, something, perhaps not like this, but if this was in a field, it would be a very good way of connecting. Um, super Wi-Fi is what they call it in America, which is unhelpful. But they, that's what they call it. Uh, partly because it comes from the IEEE standards of uh, 82.11 and then a, a letter. Um, Internet of Things, which is where I, this, this really comes in, I think this is the best use for it. That it's got fairly low bandwidth, but it's you don't need a lot of bandwidth for sensors and devices talking to each other. And you don't need a mobile operator. You don't have to pay Vodafone or anyone else to operate it. So, here's a white space. It's literally a white space on the map. So, white spaces can mean two things. There's the gaps in between the spectrum analyzer, where there's, there's free channels. And also, if you look at it on the map, you'll find in space, this channel has a white space. So, this is channel 55, um, which is equivalent to have been my TV or you know, a TV channel when the analog days. Uh, where it's red, it means it's not available because it's been used for TV uh, or some other purpose. But right here in, um, where are we? Edmund Bridge. In Edmund Bridge, it's, it's available. And it's probably a function of how many suddenly uh, hills around us. But it's actually really good for spectrum reuse. You can reuse the same frequencies again and again. But if you're on top of the hill, not so good. So it, it's available in different amounts in 
where you go in the country. So it's, it's no easy formula for what's available. But the white space database holds this information. And the white space database is fed by Ofcom from their, their plots of what's available, uh, given to them by the TV transmitting people, our keeper and BBC. And then third parties will generate uh, yes or no's, uh, such as this one, this is Spectrum Bridge. Your device will ask if, if what's available in its area, and it will return a bunch of possible spectrum you can use, and then your device starts transmitting on that. And that's the only license you need to buy. It's not even buying a license. It's asking a database what is available. So it's, it's as, as quick as switching the thing on for most purposes. Uh, maybe you need a GPS fix or something like that to say where you are first. Um, I don't think the database will look like this. This is from the National Museum of Computing. Um, or a laundrette, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, to do it, what do you need? What stuff? Um, I'll start with the commercial stuff at the moment because it's, it, it's all in flux at the moment. Uh, Mule is the company that you've probably heard of, um, if you know about white space. Uh, Mule make these base stations, they also make the terminals. Basically, it's green, it's made by Mule. Um, An antenna, it can be as simple as a TV antenna like that. It's, it, there's no big complicated things to put out there. This one is only looks unusual because it's an omnidirectional antenna to cover the whole area. Um, it doesn't need much more than sticking on a roof or on the top of a, a tower or, or even the top of a hill. If you try and go on these big masts that you see around the place, you'll probably start paying 10 to 15 pound pounds a year be there. Uh, there's a company called Arkiva, uh, uh, no offense, but they're like the German tourists of, of uh, the radio world. But wherever you go, they're already there and they've already got, they will charge you. So they've got their towels down, they'll charge you to use uh, that, they'll charge you to use the roof of any PT exchange in the country. Whoever signed that deal is the next firm. Um, if you can avoid it, just do. Go, go ask. Go and ask somebody who has a high roof uh, and something like that and, and get it up on top of there. It's played as a community thing, let them join in. That's that's the kind of place where this would work best. Um, the equipment's fairly expensive at the moment, but that's because it's early days. Uh, and when I say expensive, I mean about £8,000 for a base station, 700 quid for a terminal. But it's, it's very early days. That's what the first generation terminal looked like. And that little one there is the hopefully the aim for what size we want it to be. So that's quite a quite a string. That's why the, the price will come down. Um, that there is a Raspberry Pi for comparison and a little project uh, called AirPi, which is run by a guy called Tom Harley. Um, he's 17 and he took this device around uh, uh, Docklands with him at the Electromagnetic Wave Festival. Anyone go to that? Yeah, so we, we had this white space network. Um, and, uh, we actually put one of these in the <coughs> security hut at Docklands at uh, Canary Wharf and then put a, a Wi Fi hotspot on it. And we, we called it Lamb Overboard. It was exactly on a boat. I'm not going to. These are dad jokes. By the way, there's, there's a small child over there that's one of the projects. You can hear noises. Um, yeah, so you can see that this device here, you know, this is huge, this is ridiculous, this is like a massive battery for your old mobile phone. That's the size it will become. And there's a handy little space there that's exactly that kind of size. So you can see what the potential is that this, this will now connect to all your circuits, your devices to the internet uh, without a SIM, without an expensive G GSM card, that kind of thing. So this is the first generation, that's what's inside that box. Uh, there's actually two radios on there, they didn't need the second one. Uh, that's a laptop battery down the side, that's why 
these things. These are made of discrete components, and all you hardware geeks will probably know that you start with discrete components, and you work down to maybe make it out of FPGAs, and you get some guy who knows about FPGA programming, and that's cheaper, and it's smaller, but it's still not there. And then you get down to the chip right in the middle there, which is ultimately where they've got to. Um, unsure when they'll be available, but they are the first ASIC, uh, first application specific integrated circuit built especially for white space. And they see this as being something like Bluetooth. You'll, you'll buy a board like a, a Bluetooth board that kind of size, and you'll stick it on the project. I say projects. There's a licensing uh, agreement that you have to sign first, and that's that's why weightless may not be the best approach for open source hardware. So what else is there you can use? So you've got weightless, which is what all the green meal boxes use. They're planning to move that from proprietary into uh, an Etsy standard. Not that Etsy, the other Etsy. Uh, IEEE have 82.11F, that's the super Wi-Fi I told you about. Um, it's probably the most mature. 82.22 is for long range links, you know, 20 kilometers or more. Um, and TC, rather snappily named, TC48 TG1 from the CNA is another method to use, but uh, I don't think anyone can remember it long enough to actually work out whether to use it or not. So there are your choices, and other, that's the other important one. If, you, if any of these aren't mature enough yet, you can still build your own protocol for it. Um, this is a demo of weightless. So this is a, a, a call me train set bridge, or some approximation of, uh, with some um, strain gauges on it. Just to demonstrate how small you can make these things. Um, that is the size of the sensor box that does the strain gauges and the, the conversion probably might be controlled in there. That space there, that, is in there, that space there is big enough for the new um, the, the chips, the ASICs, the, the terminals. Right now the dev kit is quite big it wouldn't fit in the box. Uh, but that's all you need. Once you take that away and you move it all into that space. That's, that's the size of the device you're talking about. I find that quite exciting because then you can start sticking things all over the place. And the only backhaul, the only connection back to the internet you need is some, uh, something up, up on top of a town hall. Can we open source it? Can we do something ourselves? Um, anyone want to try? Put their hands up if they want to try. Interested in this kind of thing. Two hats, brilliant. So these are possible, um, you can see me afterwards, by the way. That'd be really good. Uh, uh, there's a micro, not microcontroller, there's a transceiver chip that's been built uh, by a company called Line Microsystems, I think. Uh, and they, they form part of these uh, software defined radio devices. Um, and these do all the, the heavy processing of, um, of signals and then output it to your device, which then, uh, you know, something like a fairly high powered small computer, like a drive or something, just a slightly higher than a Raspberry Pi. A parallel, for instance, if anyone's heard of those, parallel processing board. Um, all it would need to do was, is find out where it is, talk to a database using some other means on the internet. To find, to find out what's available, what's specially available, and then retune to use it in the new uh, protocol. So you've got two possible ways of doing it there, and I'd be really excited if we could build something for that. Uh, you might have to get it passed off com first, but um, it's not it's not like the FCC when you actually they actually approve the devices. Um, What's Love Hertz doing about this? Well, what we're doing is doing an Oxford pilot. So, Ofcom are trying to test this technology out. They want people to actually uh, install it and see how it works in the wild. So there's been a few trials, I mean, that one in an electromagnetic wave. Um, 
we want to do it through a sensor network. So this this orange bit is the footprint over Oxford. I don't know if you know Oxford, but that's, that's a fairly sizable area. Um, we reckon about eight kilometres, um, although the, you know the radio waves are hard to tell where they're going to go. Um, we want to do a hardware hack day, uh, and this this starts in November. Uh, with a little bit short notice, but if you'd like to do a hardware hack day on this. We want to do local applications and an awful lot of sustainability and clean tech. It's like very well in Oxford, so good for that. This is the timeline. Uh, last one pilot, uh, starting uh, in around November. That's when we're considering doing a hack day. Um, and it's going to be a little while before it's actually available for all of us. So this is going to be November. For ne uh, next year. So it is a little bit of a wait before we can actually start using this, but there's no reason to develop it in the meantime, make it something that we're actually able to put into our project. And I might have gone a bit fast there, uh, but that's, that's all the quiet spaces, that's any question about. How power hungry are the devices that we are using these frequencies? Um, um, how are those devices and how power hungry are they? Power hungry? Um, is the sensors, um, the remote sensors that are using the, these, these frequencies? The remote sensors, uh, the, the weightless standard claims that they'll be operated by a single battery for 10 years. Um, that's what they say. Yeah. Um, there's a bat yeah, there are bigger batteries. Uh, a single AA battery for 10 years. And I, I think the idea of the weightless protocol is it, it is so lightweight that it only joins the network when it has to, only wakes up when it has to, it has timers to decide when it has to, to start again and join the network again. And they reckon uh, the price will be down to about $2 per chip. Uh, I think this is, you know, at least three years away, or they're that. Um, in the blue. Uh, is there any arbitration between different users? Because we've got a Wi-Fi, that's only got a range of whatever it's 200 meters. Yeah. And you're already getting to the point where you can't, Wi-Fi doesn't work very well because there's too many users. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a range of 8 kilometers, the number of people you can have using it. Yeah. yeah. It seems like you're going to be interfering with all the rest of them. So, so that is something that, that is, uh, I'll be honest, isn't well explained. Uh, so it's, it's about coexistence. If you if you have two people on the same Wi-Fi channel, things bog down a bit. It's not unusable. It's still still possible to operate. It just slows things down a bit. If you do the same with white space, do you find the same thing happen? Considering that the Wi-Fi covers this area, and white space would cover the next kilometers. I think. Uh, I'll go back to weightless because it's, it's the one that's thought about it at least. Uh, they, they've thought about that problem and it will do that frequency hopping, it will move around the spreading, lots of other factors that... Oh, the tunes you're all been using uh, um, the same cooperative. It does assume you're using the same cross cooperative thing, but, but then, then it, that's if, you, right. if you have a look at how much is, uh, how much goes on in, in the ISM band, you know, the one ZP and uh, they're coping okay, given that their ISM bands are, are quite small. Do you disagree? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's always a concern with, with licensing to open spectrum that there is it's a tragedy of the commons of how you can get enough for everybody. There's uh, 8 megahertz per channel. Make it and then solve it. As Adrian might have told us. Um, yeah, it sounds like a cop out, but sometimes these things, when they become really important, it's going to be good. I suppose if you decide later on that you want to do 
something else you can dial down the data gates and not what it is that you can Yes, you can reduce the, the available uh, power. But you can actually tell the device that you are not allowed to use this much power, you're only allowed to use this much. Okay. You can reduce the size. So it's a fixable problem, if not when you've got all these devices out there that we've yeah, the, the devices every 15 minutes have to check that they're still authorized to use the spectrum. Um, it, there is a there is a worry about that, which is that they you can switch them off. So I say when I say you, I mean them. They can switch it off uh, if they don't like you, um, for whatever reason that might be. Um, so I think it's. I think there's a, there's a little bit of a worry about that. It's not as open and lovely as it could be. But then that's because sensing what's available is hard. Checking a database is easy. And this is the best way right now if you're actually achieving that, to jump around in the spectrum and find the free bits. So, that I did look into the future, I thought, <coughs> what could you do with this once it's, once it's every day? Um, if you combine three things that, that are coming up, there's, there's metamaterial antennas, like drafting antennas, um, that will reconfigure themselves to the right frequency. You've got software defined radio that reconfigures it itself to be <coughs> the best system, the best modulation, for the best uh, frequency. You've got the spectrum database to find out what's available. If you can quickly find out what's available, retune yourself to fit that, and then change your antenna to get that wavelength. And suddenly, you've got a very agile device that can just move around the spectrum as needed. Uh, I think that'd be quite an exciting thing in you know, five, ten years in the future. What's the maximum power you're allowed to use? And is there a limitation also on the ERP if you've got like a directional antenna? Uh, there is, uh, I'm not very good on those figures. Um, I have the Ofcom consultation that will probably answer some of those. But the, uh, the bit I tend to work on is it's around 5 to 10 kilometers range. But uh, uh, the EIRP, I, I don't know. So anybody can do that now or will it require some pre So right now, if you want to do it, you have to spray. Um, Test and development license, which uh, I was I was going to do for here, but it's, it was just too too short notice. When you have that, you can actually do, do like, like, like last year we had the um, open BTS run up up the hill, actually using GSM frequency for a very low power. So it's a little bit like that today. During the pilot, it's it's controlled automatic allocation. And next year, after they got a statutory instrument from Parliament, it'll actually be just as simple as switching it off. You won't need to ask permission. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. So, if you'd like to give a big round of applause, please. Thank you.